And let 1966 be the year that we, that we decided that we would develop our own culture, that we would be proud of being black people, that we would no longer accept the use of the word Negro, but we would become mature and we would regard ourselves as black men, black men in America. As many of you know, uh, last March, when it was announced that I was no longer in the black Muslim movement, it was pointed out that it was my intention to work among the 22 million non-Muslim Afro-Americans and to try and form some type of organization or create a situation where the young people, our young people, the students and others, could study the problems of our people for a period of time and then come up with a new analysis and give us some new ideas and some new suggestions as to how to approach a problem that too many other people had been playing around with for too long. And that we would have some kind of meeting and determine at a later date whether to form a black nationalist party or a black nationalist army. The purpose of our organization of Afro-American unity, which has the same aim and objective, to fight whoever gets in our way. <laughs> to bring about the complete independence of people of African descent here in the Western Hemisphere and first here in the United States and bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. Between the Civil War and World War II, black Southerners were no longer slaves, but they were not yet free. What happened in that period of time was so much more terrible than anything most Americans recognize or understand today. How do they bring it about? Bloodshed! You haven't got a revolution that doesn't involve bloodshed. And you're afraid to bleed. you're afraid to bleed. Long as the white man sent you to Korea, you bled. He sent you to Germany, you bled. He sent you to the South Pacific to fight the Japanese, you bled. You bleed for white people. Whenever one is in a conversation where someone says, what's wrong with black people? Why can't they get over it? Slavery ended 150 years ago. That's fundamentally false. In one of the most shameful chapters of American history, generations of black Southerners were forced to labor against their will. But when it comes time to seeing your own churches being bombed and little black girls being murdered, you haven't got no blood. Free black people could be just picked up and put in jail. The sheriff department could sell people to corporations and coal mines. He locked me up for three days. And after that, he said, if I don't go to work, he'll put me in the river down there. And you bark when the white man says bark. I hate to say this about us, but it's true. How you going People's lives were truly stolen from them. Their freedom was taken away. All the southern states used the criminal justice system to put African Americans back into a position as close to slavery as they possibly could. These were real people who were deemed to be of no value. Maybe now 
through the telling of this history, these individuals can receive some measure of justice. Buried in old courthouses, abandoned jails, libraries, and archives all across the South are tens of thousands of public documents and letters written by African Americans at the turn of the last century. being non-violent in Mississippi and Alabama when your churches are being bombed and your little girls are being murdered and at the same time you're going to get violent with Hitler and Tojo and somebody else that you don't even know. Mr. President, I have a brother about 14 years old. A man hired him from me and I heard of him no more. He went and sold him to McCree and they has been working him in prison for 12 months. He's done nothing wrong for them to keep him in chains. Written more than 40 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, these letters bear witness to a sinister and little known chapter in American history. The reality is that slavery and all of the the limitations that it imposed on the future and the potential and the progress of African-American families, it didn't end 150 years ago. It continued until World War II, well into the lives of large numbers of African-Americans today. If violence is wrong in America, violence is wrong abroad. If it's wrong to be violent, defending black women and black children and black babies and black men, then it's wrong for America to draft us and make us violent abroad in defense of her. For more than 80 years following the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of African Americans in the South were pulled back into the shadow of slavery. buying and selling African Americans ended with the 13th Amendment, but that did not translate into actual freedom. One of the fascinating things about the text of that amendment is that it says that slavery is abolished except in the case of a punishment for a crime. With emancipation, the nature of both crime and punishment in the South changed dramatically. In state after state, county after county, Laws were passed to criminalize black life. It was a crime in the South for a farm worker to walk beside a railroad. It was a crime in the South to speak loudly in the company of white women. It was a crime to sell the products of your farm after dark. But the most damaging of all of these laws were the vagrancy statutes. In every southern state, you became a criminal if you could not prove at any given moment that you were employed.
Once arrested, convicts released and forced to labor in coal mines, lumber camps, brick factories, and turpentine farms. They were shackled, imprisoned, and tortured, sometimes to the point of death. The fact that blacks were treated the way they were, like animals. People could be just picked up and put in jail. They could be lost in the system. Nobody knew how to find them. They could be buried in some grave somewhere and family's still looking for them. Don't know where they are. I didn't know that the sheriff department could sell slaves to corporations, steel plants, and coal mines. The constant threat of arrest and forced labor, like the threat of lynching, cast a shadow over the South. Slavery had ended, but true freedom had not begun. How did they bring it about? Bloodshed! If you haven't got a revolution that doesn't involve bloodshed, and you're afraid to bleed. I said you're afraid to bleed. As long as the white man sent you to Korea, you bled. He sent you to Germany, you bled. He sent you to the South Pacific to fight the Japanese, you bled. You bleed for white people. But when it comes time to seeing your own churches being bombed and little black girls murdered, you haven't got no blood. You bleed when the white man says bleed. You bite when the white man says bite. And you bark when the white man says bark. I hate to say this about us, but it's true. How are you going to be nonviolent in Mississippi as violent as you were in Korea? How can you justify being nonviolent in Mississippi and Alabama when your churches are being bombed and your little girls are being murdered? And at the same time, you're going to get violent with Hitler and Tojo and somebody else that you don't even know. <laughs> if violence is wrong in America, violence is wrong abroad. If it's wrong to be violent, defending black women and black children and black babies and black men, then it's wrong for America to draft us and make us violent abroad in defense of her. And if it is right for America to draft us and teach us how to be violent in defense of her, then it is right for you and me to do whatever is necessary to defend our own people right here in this country.